in the heart of Africa. A figure emerged from the shadows, commanding armies and shaping the destiny of nations. Join us on a journey into the life and legacy of the most notorious warlord in history, Jonas Savimbi. His story, a tapestry woven with power, conflict and defiance, unfolds in this gripping documentary. From the battlefields to the political arenas, we delve deep into the complex life of Jonas Savimbi, a man who caved his name into the turbulent chapters of African history. As we explore the heights and lows, the victories and defeats, witness the enigma that was Savimbi, and the indelible mark he left on a continent torn by strife. Thank you for joining us on this episode of African Dive. Make sure you smash the like button and subscribe. And don't forget to tell us what you remember about Jonas Savimbi in the comment section below. Jonas Savimbi was born in Muhango, Bia province, a small town in the Benguela Railway, and raised in Chileso in the same province. Savimbi's father Lote was a station master on the Angola's Benguela Railway line and a preacher of the Protestant Evangelical Congregation Church of Angola, founded and maintained by the American missionaries. Both his parents were members of the Bieno group of the Ovimbindu people, who later served as his major political base. In his early years, Savimbi was educated mainly in the Protestant schools but also attended Roman Catholic schools. At the age of 24, he received a scholarship to study in Portugal. He became associated with students from Angola and other Portuguese colonies who were preparing themselves for anti-colonial resistance and had contact with Portuguese Communist Party. He knew Agostino Neto, who was at the time studying medicine and who later became the president of MPLA and Angola's first state president. Under increasing pressure from Portuguese secret police, Savimbi left Portugal for Switzerland with the assistance of Portuguese and French communists. There he was able to obtain a new scholarship from the American missionaries. He then went to the University of Freiburg for further studies. While there, probably in August 1960, he met Holden Roberto, who was at the time a rising star. Roberto was the founding member of the UPA and was already known for his efforts to promote Angola's independence at the United Nations. He tried to recruit Savimbi, who seemed to have been undecided whether to commit himself to the cause of Angola's independence at that point of his life. Savimbi sought leadership position in the MPLA by joining the MPLA youth in the early 1960s. He was rejected by the MPLA and joined forces with National Liberation Front of Angola, FNLA, in 1964. The same year, he conceived UNITA with Antonio de Costa Fernandez. Savimbi went to China for help and was promised arms and military training. Upon returning to Angola in 1966, he launched UNITA and began his career as anti-Portuguese guerrilla fighter. He also fought the FNLA and MPLA as the three resistant movements tried to position themselves to lead post-colonial Angola. Portugal later released archives revealing that Savimbi had signed a collaboration pact with Portuguese colonial authorities to fight the MPLA. Following Angola's independence in 1975, Savimbi gradually drew the attention of powerful Chinese and ultimately American policymakers and intellectuals. Trained in China during the 1960s, Savimbi was a highly successful guerrilla fighter, schooled in classic Maoist approaches to warfare, including baiting his enemies with multiple military fronts some of which attacked and some of which consciously retreated, like the Liberation Army of Mao Zedong. Savimbi mobilized important, although ethnically confined segments of the rural peasantry, overwhelmingly of Vimbindu, as part of his military tactics. From a military strategic standpoint, he was considered one of the most effective guerrilla leaders in the 20th century. As the MPLA was supported by the Soviet bloc since 1974, 
and declared itself a Marxist-Leninist in 1977. Savimbi renounced his earlier Mao Zedong learnings and contacts with China, presenting himself on the international scene as a protagonist of anti-communism. The war between MPLA and UNITA, whatever its internal reasons and dynamics were, thus became part of the Cold War, with both Moscow and Washington viewing the conflict as important to the global balance of power. Savimbi's US-based supporters like President Ronald Reagan became helpful after CIA channeled covert weapons and recruited guerrillas for Savimbi's war against Angola's Marxist government. During a visit to Washington DC in 1986, Reagan invited Savimbi to meet with him at the White House. Following the meeting, Reagan spoke of UNITA winning a victory that electrifies the world. Two years later, with the Angolan civil war intensifying, Savimbi returned to Washington, where he praised the Heritage Foundation work on UNITA's behalf. Complementing his military skills, Savimbi also impressed many with his intellectual qualities. He spoke seven languages fluently, including Portuguese, French and English. In visits to foreign diplomats and in speeches before American audience, he often cited classical Western political and social philosophy, ultimately becoming one of the most vocal anti-communists of the third world. Savimbi biography describes him as an incredible linguist. He spoke four European languages, including English. Although he had never lived in an English-speaking country, he was extremely well-read. He was extremely fine conversationalist and a very good listener. Savimbi also accused his political opponents of witchcraft. These contrasting images of Savimbi will play out through his life. His enemies calling him power-hungry warmonger, and his American and other allies calling him a crucial figure in the West bid to win the Cold War. As U.S. support began to flow liberally, and leading U.S. conservatives championed this cause, Savimbi won major strategic advantage in the late 1980s and again in the early 1990s. After having taken part unsuccessfully in the general election of 1992, as consequence, Moscow and Havana began to reevaluate the engagement in Angola. As Soviet and Cuban fatalities mounted and Savimbi ground control increased. By 1989, UNITA had the total control of several limited areas, but was able to develop significant guerrilla operations several in Angola. With the exception of the coastal cities and Namibia province, at the height of his military success in 1989 and 1990s, Savimbo was beginning to launch attacks on government and military targets in and around the country's capital, Luanda. Observers felt that the strategic balance in Angola had shifted, and that Savimbo was positioning UNITA for a possible military victory. Signaling the concern the Soviet Union was placing on Savimbi's advance in Angola, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev raised the Angolan war with Reagan during numerous U.S.-Soviet summits. In addition to meeting Reagan, Savimbi also met Reagan's successor, George W. Bush, who promised Savimbi all appropriate and effective assistance. In January 1990 and again in February 1990, Savimbi was wounded in armed conflict with Angolan government troops. The injuries did not prevent him from again returning to Washington, where he met with his American supporters and President Bush in an effort to further increase U.S. military assistance to UNITA. Savimbi supporters wondered that continued Soviet support for the MPLA was threatening broader global collaboration between Gorbachev and the U.S. In February 1992, Antonio da Costa Fernandez and Nzau Puna defected from UNITA, declaring publicly that Savimbi was not interested in a political test but on preparing another war. Under military pressure from UNITA, Angolan government negotiated ceasefire 
with Savimbi. And Savimbi ran for president in the national elections of 1992. Foreign monitors claimed that the election was fair. But because neither Savimbi 40% nor Angola's president Jose de Santos 49% obtained 50% necessary to prevail, a runoff election was scheduled. In the late 1992, Savimbi dispatched UNITA vice president Jeremiah Chitunda and UNITA senior advisor Elias Salupeto Pena to Luanda to negotiate the details of the run of elections. On 2nd November 1992 in Luanda, Chitunda and Pena convoy was attacked by government forces and they were both pulled out of their cars and shot dead. Their bodies were taken by the government authorities and never seen again. The MPLA offensive against UNITA and the FNLA has come to be known as Alawin Massacre, where over 10,000 of their voters were massacred nationwide by the MPLA forces, alleging government electoral fraud and questioning the government commitment to peace. Savimbi withdrew from the runoff and resumed fighting. Mostly their foreign funds, UNITA again quickly advanced militarily encircling the national capital of Luanda. In 1994, UNITA signed a new peace accord. Savimbi declined the vice presidency that was offered to him and again renewed fighting in 1998. Savimbi also reportedly purged those within UNITA whom he saw as dressed to his leadership or as questioning his strategic cause. According to Fred Bringland, Savimbi's foreign secretary, Tito Chingunji, and much of his family, possibly numbered to more than 60, were murdered in 1991 after Savimbi suspected that Chingunji had been in secret and approved negotiation with the government during Chingunji's various diplomatic assignments in Europe and the United States. Savimbi denied this involvement in the Chingunji killing and blamed it on UNITA's dissidents. According to Bringland in his book The War for Africa, 12 months that transformed a continent. In an earlier incident termed as Red September, Savimbi oversaw the torture and killing of dozens of people, including many of his own officers, their wives and children, in a witchcraft ritual. Bringland also stated that Aurora Catalayo, widow of UNITA leader Mateus Catalayo, whom Savimbi had allegedly killed a few years earlier, and our four-year-old son were burned alive accused of witchcraft. After surviving more than six assassination attempts and having been reported dead at least 17 times, Savimbi was killed on 22nd February 2002 in a battle with Angolan government troops alongside the riverbanks of Mexico, his birthplace. In the firefight, Savimbi sustained 15 gunshot wounds to his head, throat, upper body and legs. While Savimbi returned fire, his wound proved fatal. He died almost instantly. Savimbi's somewhat mysterious reputation of eluding the Angolan military and their Soviet and Cuban military advisors led many Angolans to question the validity of the reports of his death in combat until pictures of his bloodied body appeared on the Angolan state television and the United States Department subsequently confirmed it. He was buried in Luena Main Cemetery in Mosico province. On 3rd January 2008, his tomb was vandalized and four members of youth wing of the MPLA were charged and arrested. His body was exhumed and reburied publicly in 2019. Thank you for watching. This has been Dan Koge from African Dive. Kindly share, subscribe, like the video. Until next time, have a good one.